All right, so tonight we're going to continue on with our heaven study. I hope y'all have enjoyed this so far. It's really been interesting to me to really kind of do a survey of each one of these books and see this progressive revelation that God has revealed about heaven. So the lesson last week was looking at Genesis. And we saw even with Genesis we, uh, that Israel already kind of had an understanding about heaven about paradise, the Garden of Eden, and uh, really a loss of paradise, and the fact that we have this desire to return to paradise. We also saw in Genesis an understanding of souls departing, and you know where are these souls going? What is the, the outcome of, of death? Also, we saw the understanding that bodies could live forever. If you remember, Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, so they wouldn't continue to eat from the tree of life. And one day, as we had gone through a revelation study, we see that the tree of life will be available to us once again. And in our resurrected bodies, we will live forever in uh, body and soul together. And also something that we saw in Genesis that we didn't see particularly in Job was a reunion with family in the afterlife. And that's certainly one thing that people have a great expectation about in uh, heaven. So again... Through this study, we've seen that there's been a progressive revelation about heaven. They didn't have every understanding about heaven that we have today. And the truth is, we need special revelation to know anything about heaven, for we're not in heaven. So God has to reveal heaven to us to understand anything. So this is the definition we've been going through. And you'll see in the definition that I have some of the items bold and italicized. And these are the things from the book of Job and Genesis that we have already found in the text. So very, very early on, we already have some understanding about heaven. It says, heaven is a spiritual realm where the greatest intensity of God's presence dwells. It is where God rules from his throne with the resurrected Jesus at his right hand. Holy angels and the souls of the redeemed, those that have been forgiven by grace through faith, live in heaven. Satan currently has access to the heavenly courtroom and accuses the saints daily. One day, Satan will be cast out of the heavenly courtroom forever. The souls of the redeemed saints will be reunited with resurrected and glorified bodies and will dwell on earth with Jesus for a thousand years. After the millennium, God will create a new universe on earth. Heaven will come down to earth and the redeemed will live forever with God in a glorified body on the new earth. So the questions below our definition here. Or what we're answering each time as we do a survey of the books. So again, Job and Genesis. What is heaven? Heaven or heavens, as you see in scripture, sometimes just refers to atmosphere and space in general. Also, it does refer to the dwelling place of God and the angels. We've already seen this in Job and Genesis. In Job also, we see that Satan has some kind of access to the heavenly courtroom. Where is heaven? Uh, not on earth. That's clear from the text. Somewhere else, perhaps a spiritual realm. And really up above is a continual description that you see of heaven. And perhaps that description of heaven sometimes in the text is describing even the third heaven, as they would say uh, later in the New Testament. So it's up above. Who goes to heaven? And this is one that we're continuing to get more answers about. But so far in Job and Genesis, it's not completely clear if anyone goes to heaven. And it's not saying that they don't go to heaven. But just from the text itself, it's not clear as of yet. But in Genesis, we did find two particular interesting points. Is Enoch didn't die. He went somewhere. And I think it's very obvious on this side of Revelation that we know he went to heaven. And that's where Enoch ended up at. But the text did not make that absolutely clear. And also we see that Rachel's soul departed her, bar, her body. So where did her soul go? Again, on this side of Revelation, we understand that her soul is likely with God in heaven. Also, we did see those throughout that even though we don't know who for sure goes to heaven yet in the text, we do see that the wicked face judgment. Now, where did the wicked face judgment? If we said it's just in this life, it really doesn't make any sense, does it? Because all people die, even followers of God. So the great uh, settlement really is the afterlife, where God uh, settles all accounts. So the wicked face judgment, and we know again on this side of Revelation that judgment is in hell. So what happens when we die? 
We talked about that the body and then through Genesis, maybe the soul goes to a place called Sheol or the pit. And it's really a mysterious place of the dead that's really not distinct. And, you know, there could be a description of heaven and hell just saying in Sheol. But we don't know for sure from the text. Uh, we also see that the body returns to dust as we were made from dust. So it goes to the grave. This is something that you can observe. But also the fact that the soul departs the body. You know, what is the end of life but the soul is gone from the body? And we also saw, even beginning in Job, that there seems to be some kind of rest or no trouble in the afterlife in heaven. And then in Genesis, we saw over and over again this description of being reunited with family. So there's lots of understandings already. What will we be like in heaven? That's not clear yet in Job and Genesis. But we're going to get a hint of that actually tonight in Exodus. And also we talked about that perhaps God and the angels can see people from heaven. And, you know, does that mean that the souls that are in heaven can also see people? We don't know clearly from the text. What will we do in heaven? That's not clear yet. What is heaven like? It is a place with God and angels. That's something that's just reemphasized over and over again. And then in Job again, that Satan has access to heaven. And if heaven is paradise, as we often refer to it, maybe it is like the Garden of Eden. For you remember when God created, it was all good. It was all very good until sin entered the wor world, until the fall. And in the Garden of Eden, we have God dwelling with people and there is no sin. So certainly that is giving us a picture of what heaven is like. Well, how can we know anything about heaven? Again, special revelation. That is, you can't just look at the world and understand what heaven is like. It's got to be from God, a voice from heaven, perhaps a dream, perhaps a vision. Uh, perhaps even from an angel. So this is the only way we can know about heaven. And did the Jews are, uh, always believe in heaven after the life of the resurrection? This has been kind of the big question that we've been unpacking because there are many that try to argue that the Jewish people didn't believe in the afterlife until after the exile. So that would have been after they had gone uh, to Assyria, Israel, and then the J Judah going to Babylon and coming back and having more of an understanding. But that's not what we see already in Job. It's not what we see in Genesis already as well. They obviously understood heaven as God's dwelling place. So God is there. There is a question if there's any hope of us going to heaven thus far in the text. There is a belief that the soul departs the body. Again, where does it go? And then there's the belief in the resurrection that is in the oldest book of the Bible, which is Job. And obviously the resurrection becomes a major theme as you go throughout the Bible. And then we understand the resurrection of Jesus is our hope of the resurrection as well. We see he is the first of the resurrection. So there's a belief that the body could live forever already in the Garden of Eden. And certainly that's what's going to happen is the body is going to live forever one day. So now we pick up in the book of Exodus. What is heaven? The atmosphere and space. We see that again, same in Job and Genesis. Uh, the text here, Exodus 24 and 10. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take for yourself handfuls of ashes from a furnace and let Moses scatter it toward the heavens in the sight of Pharaoh. So this is Moses and Aaron coming before Pharaoh in Egypt. And I think you really could take that word heavens even in that context there and perhaps describe God's dwelling place too. You know, he's got the third heavens, but it's certainly up. Is going into the atmosphere, into space. And the description of heaven like that does not negate the fact that heaven, as we understand, is God's dwelling place. It's just another use of the word. But it is God's dwelling place. Again, that is clear in Exodus. And Exodus 20 and 22, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. So where has God spoken to Moses from but heaven? So again, heaven is somewhere else. And here is just a, a clear indication of a special revelation. God spoke to Moses and Moses spoke to Israel. So we're understanding more and more about heaven, about God. So this is God speaking to man from heaven. And where is heaven? Again, that understanding of up above. So it's transcendent. God is not exactly here with us in the same way that he is in heaven. Exodus 2 and 23 describes, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. So this is the beginning of Exodus. 
Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So they were in slavery, and God heard their cries, heard their groanings. So a moment ago, we talked about that God was speaking to Moses from heaven, but it's not only heaven communicating to earth, but earth communicating to heaven. So this is, a, you know, prayers, the fact that God hears us and God heard the cries of Israel as they were in slavery. So God is transcendent, but he's also close. God is not this absentee God. It's not a deist view of God making everything and then not being involved in creation. He is absolutely involved with us and he hears our prayers. He heard the prayers of Israel going up. So this is already an understanding in Exodus. And also Exodus 25 and 22, this is really even more detailed about speaking to God and our uh, being able to communicate to heaven. It says, and there I will meet with you. So this is in the Holy of Holies inside of the tabernacle. There I will meet with you and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat. So the mercy seat, if you remember, is on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. From between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So this mercy seat is a very important uh, imagery for Israel. As it's sitting on top of the ark, it is as, as if it is the footstool of God. So if it's the footstool of God, where is God? Up. Yep, up above. So God is coming down and touching the earth. His feet are upon the the, uh, the mercy seat on top of the ark. And I love also with that imagery, if you think about what was in the ark of the covenant. The covenant, right? The Ten Commandments, the testimony. And as they would have the Day of Atonement, the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. So as God looks down, those commandments that have been broken are covered by blood. I love that imagery. For we see that's the same as God looks upon us when we accept Christ. He looks at the laws we have broken, but they are covered by the blood of Christ. Christ Absolutely. Israel really had a special privilege of hearing God in a, in a unique way and even speaking to God in a unique way. For God chose Israel. He did. He chose to reveal himself to Israel. And it was always to be a blessing to the nations, to all people. If you remember the promise to Abraham in the book of Genesis, that he would be a blessing to all nations. Now, how was that to take place? Now, certainly Israel was to tell everyone about the one true God. But ultimately, the way that that was fulfilled is through Jesus, who became a man, a Jewish man. And all nations are blessed through Jesus Christ. So where is heaven? It's up above. But God is communicating with his people and his people are able to communicate with him. Now, let's go to this next question. Who goes to heaven? So far. Come in. Sure. It's just something that keeps rolling around in my head. <laughs> up. Mm -hmm. Up to us is up. Right. Where is up to Egypt? Up. Up. Where is up? up to Africa? Up. That means God is in all that space. Oh, yes. Yeah. Omnipresent in that regard. That's mind blowing. Mm hmm. And, you know, going back to the definition that we have been looking at that heaven is really where the greatest intensity of God's presence dwells. It's not that God is not here, but his presence, his glory is truly revealed in full in heaven. But you're right. You know, it doesn't matter. It's too. <laughs> That's right. And you know, why is it that even in all of these false religions, where do they pray at? They pray up. They understand that God is transcendent, that he's something beyond, somewhere beyond where we are. That's absolutely true. So where is heaven? It's, it's, it's in the beyond, wherever that beyond is. And as we have been going through this, so we know God's there, but who goes to heaven? And Job and Genesis, it hasn't been absolutely clear. But again, when we look at it from a New Testament perspective, we know where the destination is. It is heaven for those that have trusted God by faith. But here in Exodus, again, it's not really completely clear. But there is a fear of death that we see that's kind of unpacking in Exodus. In Exodus 12 and 33, this is after the plagues have, become, have come upon Egypt. How do the Egyptians respond? 
The Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. So let's get rid of those Israelites for they said, we shall be dead. There's a fear of death. And you know, it's really a general fear that's shared across cultures, across time. There's just this fear of death that we have. What comes next? Why is there a fear of death? For truly, if death is just the end of existence, what is there to fear? There's really nothing to fear if it's just the end of existence. But if there is a judgment, if there is an accountability of standing before God, and that fear has just been set in us, even those that do not know the true God just have this fear of death. And even the Egyptians who did not really know the true God, they fear death too. You've got to get those Israelites out of here. We're going to die. It's going to be the end. But we don't know for sure, again, in Exodus, who goes to heaven. It's not clear. But then there's another kind of note here in Exodus 16 and 3 to, that's worth pondering is maybe death isn't a bad thing. Maybe it's a, something the culture is not afraid of. Exodus 16 and 3, the children of Israel said to them, so to Moses and Aaron, I believe, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Now you might pass over that real quick and say, well, what, how is death not bad here? But, you know, they, they understood death is a part of life, right? There's an expectation that we're going to die. But here they are not living their best life now. You see that? They, they, they know they're going to die, but they would rather die beside the pots of meat and when they were able to eat bread to the full so they can have their best life now. Death's going to come, so maybe it's not such a bad thing. But, you know, truthfully, it's short-sighted when we think that the best life is, is now and that we're looking for the best things now. And I'm sure y'all probably heard Joel Osteen's book. It talks about having the best life now. But John MacArthur, I really like John MacArthur, and he usually doesn't, um, mince words very much. He said, if you've got the best life now, that means you're going to hell. That's fine. Think about that. If you have the best life now, that means you're going to hell because heaven is so much better than what we're dealing with now. But there is an expectation across cultures that we're going to die. We want our best life now. But there is so much more. And God is revealing that to us through Scripture. And He's revealing that to Israel. There's so much more than just the now what we're dealing with now. So again, it's not clear who goes to heaven, but death is judgment on the wicked and the unholy. You know, we've already talked about that in Job, where we saw that not only, not only do the wicked suffer, right? The righteous too. Those that trust God suffer. Job faced that. We also see that all people face death. So there is some kind of judgment on the wicked and unholy. In Exodus 19 and 12, so after Israel has already left Egypt, it says, you shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves, that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Now, why are they being put to death for touching the mountain? You don't know? Who's on the mountain? God, who is holy. The unholy approaches God presumptuously. What happens to them? They die. There's judgment. See, there's judgment on the wicked and there's judgment on the unholy. And, you know, we uh, see there's an early understanding of the justice in a way. The fact that God is holy and that God is a judge and that really justice is only possible if there's an afterlife. Now, we should continue to come back to thinking about this because all people die. So if death itself is the only judgment upon the wicked, we're getting judged too, right? But if there's an afterlife. If there is an accountability before God, then we are truly judged before God. And it's either on our own account or on the account of Jesus Christ. And so we see here that unholy people cannot approach God. And that is a huge theme that we're going to continue to unpack, not only in Exodus, but next week in Leviticus too. Unholy cannot approach God or they die. So there's a punishment for approaching God. So again, we don't know for sure who goes to heaven, but just looking at the full revelation, understanding that God is holy and that the wicked are judged, but all people die, there's got to be an afterlife. There's already this conclusion that there's got to be a judgment after death itself. 
So what happens when we die? We talked about in Genesis that there seems to be a reunion with family. But now here's something else that may be worth understanding. In Exodus 14 and 13, maybe we don't see some people in the afterlife. It says, Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Now here's the key word, forever. Certainly the Egyptians were chasing the Israelites and we know the Red Sea crossing. The Egyptians died and certainly they didn't see their bodies anymore alive, did they? But what about this forever? Is there like an eternal separation? And this is just kind of a hint of this again, that maybe we don't see some people. Maybe in the afterlife there is reunion with some, but some are, are not reunited. Now, I think that's an important thought to carry forward for people that lose a loved one that's lost. So you think, well, I don't want to go to heaven because my loved one's not in heaven. But there's no promise in scripture of a reunion in hell. Have you ever thought about that? There's no promise of that, of a reunion in hell. So, you know, if we have joy of being reunited with our family in heaven. Certainly there's no joy in hell. So there's a reunion, but maybe we won't see some people forever. Again, this is just little hints of things that we see throughout the scripture. Uh, what happens when we die? It's not clear, but it still brings mourning. Uh, the fact that we weep over the death. Exodus 12 and 30. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he, all his servants, and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. So this was after, um, this is the Passover time, the Egyptians had died. And we see mourning. Again, this is a cross-cultural thing. The death just, you know, it brings mourning. Perhaps it's because we've lost this loved one here. Well, I'd say perhaps, certainly it's because we've lost this loved one here. But is there hope beyond the grave? And we know there is hope beyond the grave. This is really our comfort in Christ, of knowing that there is a reunion, knowing that, that this is not the, the end of life at all. And we see this hint in Exodus 3 and 6. Now, this is really better defined in the book of Matthew by Jesus himself. But Exodus 3 and 6 says, Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. So as we read this Old Testament passage through New Testament lens, do you remember what Jesus used this passage for? He said, God is not the God of the dead, but he is the God of the living. When he says, I am the God of your father, he's not just saying, I am the same God, but I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who stand before me. Who continue to live before me. So again, we have to look at this through a New Testament lens. But there's God revealing very early on that we keep on living. Heaven. We keep on living and standing before God. So Jesus reveals that he is the God of the living. But Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died long before Jesus was walking on the earth. But they were still very much alive. What will we be like in heaven? Well, you know, we haven't got clear answers in Job and Genesis, but here's something we could even truthfully pull out of Job and Genesis 2, is we must be holy if we're in heaven because God's presence is there. For God is holy. And certainly this is something that's reinforced over and over again that God is in heaven. We know that. Job, Genesis, it's clear. Exodus is clear. God is in heaven. That's his presence there. And if God is holy, then... We must be holy if we can go to heaven. Exodus 30, 20 through 21 says, When they go into the tabernacle meeting, or when they come near to the altar to minister, so this is for the priest, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water, lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, lest they die. And it shall be a statue forever to them and to him and his descendants throughout their generations. So we must be cleansed. And you see, in Leviticus it shows this even more, but we're unholy people. We're dirty. To come before a holy God, something must be done about our sin. So we have a ritual washing here described, sacrifice that's made for the priest. And to approach God, we must be holy. But all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
these priests coming. They had to prepare themselves before they approached God each time. So this is going to become a big, big issue as we unpack more and more about heaven is if God is in heaven, as scripture tells us, and God is holy, as scripture tells us, then if we're going to be in God's presence, we've got to be holy, too. And that's what Leviticus just reinforces over and over again through the sacrifice that we'll talk about next week. Wouldn't that also indicate baptism? In what way? Just if the cleansing? to be washed with water. And baptism is our water. So it's a symbolic, uh, baptism is a symbolic washing. Yes. And it actually goes back to some of the Jewish practices of ritual cleansing, especially for women after uh, menstruation would go and have this particular ritual cleansing. That's where some of that idea comes from. But yeah, you know, we're baptized as being buried with Christ and risen to walk in newness of life. But it's also a washing away of sins. We're cleaning up. You know, we understand that, don't we? When maybe we go to uh, someone's house, I think about it as a child, you know, you go outside and play in mud. Your mama's been mopping the kitchen. You come in. Mama doesn't want you to come into that kitchen, does she? Until you get cleaned up. And truthfully, this is clean heaven for us to walk into. We've got to get cleaned up before we walk in there. So again, this is a big issue that we'll continue to see more and more about through it. So what will we do in heaven? Well, this one's kind of interesting. And we will see later in Scripture that it's definitely a fact. Maybe we eat in heaven. Do y'all like that? We're going to eat in heaven. And what we just get a little bit of in Exodus is the manna. If you remember, it's called bread from heaven. And actually in Psalm 78 and 25, it's described as the food of angels. So it's a description of heaven. But we do have more descriptions of eating uh, later in Scripture too. But in Exodus 16 and 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will bring bread from heaven for you. So certainly it's coming from the atmosphere in some way. But no, this is heaven, heaven. This is God's dwelling place. He's giving us... Giving them manna. Do you remember what manna means? Anybody? Beth, you know it, don't you? What is it? What is it? Yeah, they looked at it and they're like, what is that? And that's the name manna. <laughs> what is that? What in the world is that? So maybe we eat in heaven. That sounds like a joyous time for sure. Uh, also in heaven, I think we pursue holiness to approach God. Like in the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was another picture that we're going to see. And I'll talk about that actually in this next question coming up. But if heaven, if tabernacle is an image of heaven, certainly we are pursuing holiness even in heaven. So the activities in the tabernacle, you remember they involve offering, they involve sacrifices, they involve pursuing holiness, getting clean and living for God. And certainly living for God is always pursuing holiness, isn't it? And that's how we will be in heaven. We will pursue holiness. We will follow God. We will be pleasing to God. So pursuing holiness. And guess what? That kind of goes back to the question we talked about just a minute ago. If God is in heaven and God is holy and we must be holy, we're pursuing holiness in heaven. It all connects together. We need to be clean. We need to continue to follow God. So uh, what is heaven like? That's the next question here. Well, it certainly is a holy place because God dwells there. Let's reemphasize that over and over again. We should not really approach God presumptuously. We have to be prepared. We have to come to him on his terms. Exodus 3 and 5, as Moses comes near to the burning bush, then he said, do not draw near this place. This is God speaking. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Now Moses had not stepped into heaven, but why was that ground holy? God was in it. Exactly. And what is heaven but holy? Again, you cannot just run upon God. And I think this is just a, an error that many people have in their minds thinking that we should all be able to go to heaven. Something's got to be done about our sins. We cannot approach God on our terms. And that's always where we fail. Exodus 28, 43 continues to reemphasize this. They shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they come into the tabernacle meeting. So they're being prepared, the priest. And when they come to the tabernacle meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, that they do not incur iniquity or sin and die. It shall be a statue forever to him and his descendants after him. 
So we must approach God on his terms. And we see that so much in Exodus and Leviticus as God reveals these sacrifices. This is the way you build a tabernacle. This is the way you come before God. And this is certainly as he tells us today. You're not just going to get to heaven because you've been a good person. Because none of us are truly good. We've all fallen short of God's holy standard. You will go to heaven through Jesus Christ. By turning to Jesus Christ to be saved, to be washed, to become holy. So if anybody goes to heaven, it's on God's terms. That is clear. And the tabernacle. Let's go back to the tabernacle for a minute. The tabernacle is described in Hebrews 8 and 5 as a model or an image of heaven. So the tabernacle is this reflection of heaven in some way. And if you go through actually the whole uh, canon, you know, we have the Garden of Eden where God's dwelling with the people. It's like it's a temple. You ever think about Garden of Eden like a temple? It's a temple where God dwells with his people. And then we have the tabernacle, God dwelling with his people. The temple, God dwelling with his people. The Holy Spirit, God dwelling with his people. Heaven, God dwelling with his people. So all these things actually carry forward. But tabernacle is a model of heaven. Exodus 25 and 9, God tells Moses clearly, According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all his furnishings, just so shall you make it. And again, through our New Testament lens of Hebrews 8 and 5, this is a model of heaven. And certainly they understood that. The, um, the candlestick that was in the holy place. We've talked about that in the Revelation study. Do you remember what it represented? The tree of life. Garden of Eden. Tree of life. Revelation. Tree of life in heaven. Tree of life in the tabernacle and the temple. The Jewish people understood these images very much so. So heaven coming to earth. Now, does that sound like anything we'll talk about later? Heaven coming to earth? This is revelation. When God makes the new heaven, the new heavens and new earth, and heaven comes down to earth. So these pictures are all throughout scripture from the very beginning. We see that the tabernacle is a holy place. And so it is a reflection of heaven, of God's dwelling place. And truthfully, the word tabernacle, that's exactly what it means, is God really taking up residence there with Israel. And when it talks about in the New Testament of the Holy Spirit dwelling within our hearts, do you know what that word is really saying? Taber tabernacling in our hearts. God dwelling with us. So the tabernacle was God's presence with them. So how can we know anything about heaven? We've discussed this. We saw some visions in Genesis, but it's special revelation. And really, Moses, God spoke to Moses in a very unique way, in ways that we don't see in other times. How many burning bushes have you read about? Have you ever seen a burning bush speak to you? No. You know, God speaks in unique ways. He's really not limited, but Moses, God spoke to Moses through the burning bush, but then through the mountain, and then later through this tent of meeting that he sets up, and he goes to speak to, to God in the tent of meeting. And as God speaks to Moses, he dictated the word to him. So the Pentateuch, that is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are from Moses, from God. So he's writing what God has revealed to him. And certainly that's where we get the image of, of creation. How do we know where creation came from? God told Moses. He wrote it down. And all the things we talked about in Genesis about heaven... God gave it to Moses and he wrote it down. Here we are in Exodus. God gave it to Moses and he wrote it down. And it's going to continue on as we look through the Pentateuch. And then we'll, it'll continue on as we go through Scripture. For all Scripture is God breathed. That is God revealing it to men. God guiding these men to reveal truths to us. So that last question that we have been discussing. Did the Jews always believe in heaven, the afterlife, or the resurrection? Well, we see just here in Exodus. They believe that God is in heaven. He's in heaven. He communicates from heaven. He's speaking to them. A temple is in heaven, which is the image of the tabernacle here in Exodus. And we see that heaven must be a holy place for God dwells there. So there's lots of already understandings about heaven. And how do we get to heaven? You know, that's the question we have a full understanding of, again, through the New Testament lens. But we see in Exodus the importance of God's presence. And we also see the importance of the promised land in Exodus. And as you get to Joshua, you get more, more understanding of that. 
But God's presence is very, very important. And, you know, the near-death death experiences that you read about sometimes, I always find it odd that many times there's a description of family, but they already ever describe God. You know, seeing God or God's presence there. Yeah, just a light. But sometimes they don't even give that aspect of it. But, you know, God's presence fills heaven in such a unique way that it's hard to imagine that you'd go to heaven and God's not just overwhelming of his presence being there, too. So his presence is so important and it's so important to Israel as they are going through the wilderness and as they conquer the promised land. They need God's presence there. They need his presence. We need his presence. And God has given us his presence, the Holy Spirit dwelling within our hearts. He's always with us. He's guiding us. He's illuminating scripture to us. He's giving us greater understanding and he's guiding us to all truth and he is guiding us to pursue holiness. So God's presence is so important. And to enter God's presence, something must be done about sin. We already see this in Exodus. Leviticus unpacks it even more. So if this is true on earth, that to enter God's presence, something must be done about sin, as you enter the tabernacle, as the temple. If that's true on earth, then how much more in heaven? How much more in heaven will we have to be clean, to be holy before God? And again, we know that we are cleansed, forgiven of all sins through Jesus Christ and his shed blood. And the tabernacle we discussed a moment ago is a model of heaven. And it reminds us this tabernacle of God's holiness and man's sinfulness. Let's not forget those two elements. God's holiness and man's sinfulness. We must, must approach God on his terms. And he was revealing to Israel how you can approach me. How you can deal with the fact that you have sin. How you can approach holy God. And the tabernacle always reminds them of that. Holiness of God. And then the promised land. We didn't really talk much about that through these other questions, but the promised land that we're leaving out of Egypt, there's an expectation of a better land that is abundant in resources and freedom, right? How often have you heard people describe heaven as the promised land? It is. It's the true promised land. Think about that abundant resources and freedom, free of sin. It really is the true promised land. And in the end, when God creates the new heavens and the new earth, and we would dwell with God in body and soul forever on the new heavens and new earth. It'll be in paradise. It will be in the promised land. So you see, we've got the Garden of Eden, paradise. You've got the promised land that Israel is going to. All of this just gives us a bigger understanding of the heaven is being with God. The presence of God and sin removed. The, again, we just find more and more about this as we go through scripture. So next week, we'll talk more about Leviticus and understanding what it is to be cleansed, to be able to approach the holiness of God. Father, I thank you for your word tonight. And I thank you for all that you have revealed just in Job and Genesis and Exodus as we've looked at heaven. And I pray that you would help us to understand in a greater manner your holiness and the fact that we cannot approach you on our terms that we must listen to you. That we must understand that we have to be cleansed of our sin to be able to approach your holiness. To be able to dwell in heaven. And I thank you so much for revealing yourself to us through the Holy Scriptures. Help us not to forsake the Holy Scriptures that you have given us. For you want to speak to us. You want to reveal yourself to us. And I pray that you would just continue to encourage our hearts as we go through trials and tribulations in this life, knowing that this is not the end. This is not the best life, that heaven awaits all those that turn to Christ for salvation. Encourage our hearts and help us to encourage others and tell others the hope that is in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.